Uncle Ovim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vota. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us, and uh, I look forward to tonight. Um, I really trust with the team that the Holy Spirit will just give us wisdom and revelation and understanding as to uh, what he wishes to do tonight, and we just commit everything into his hands. And um, we just trust as we go through the book of, or as we go through the beginnings of the book of Judges, that it will have the same impact that it had on me in, pre in preparing this. And, you know, one of the things that we find often about some of the books of the Bible is that, you know, we, we, we skip things or we find certain portions that, um, that we that we lean towards, you know, and and Judges is a particular book like that because you know we know we know the story about Samson and Delilah, we know the story about this one, we know the story about that one, and uh, and they're good stories, but in reality it's not really a story, uh, it's 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 scriptural, it's history, it's 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 part of God's greater plan to get us where we are today. And, and to save mankind, because if it wasn't for if it wasn't for these great uh, heroes and heroines that that uh, um, Pastor Hannes and Christo are going to talk about in the next two weeks, um, I will touch on them. But I'm not going to go into what they want to do because I think that would be that would not be right. But uh, if we don't take this into that context and we understand that it's part of God's plan. If we understand, like we say, that all scripture is written by God for by under, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that these these books, these these words that have been penned, uh, are they not just uh, as a story tale? It's not a Hans, Hansel and Gretel type story. Uh, this is real stuff. And if we don't understand, uh, yes, and it's a it's a good story if we look at it from a storybook perspective. But the Bible is not a storybook. Uh, it, uh, it, it is a catalogue of events that that have been that have been prepared for us that that we get taught out of. And I must be honest, I I, I got taught a lot since Sunday when I started preparing. I really found that the Book of Judges is just not a storybook. And I I really want to just say to you that this evening that uh, we need to look at Scripture in a different way. We we really need to um, to delve into the scriptures. We really need to spend time going into the scriptures and find out why are they there? What are they speaking to us about? Uh, where does it point us in? Um, uh, you know, it says all scripture is there is there for, uh, for for the building up, for the edification of the saints. It's for, it's for direction. It's to guide us. Uh, and we need to apply these things into our life because if we don't, uh, as we go through, you'll see that the, the tribe of Israel didn't apply these things, and you'll see what the consequences were. And it's actually quite scary. And one of the sad one of the sad things is, in 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 uh, looking at at the book of Judges, if you compare it to to today, what is actually happening today, it's no more different. The same things that are happened then are the same things that are happening today. Uh, and, you know, the Bible says that there's nothing new under the sun. It's just a repetition of, of stuff. And you'll see when I talk about repetition towards the end uh, of this evening, uh, that the same system, the same this, the same um, play script is just revisited again and again, but just in a different format. So tonight we're going to look at when judges ruled and the, and the portions of scriptures that we're going to relate to in principle is from Judges 1.1 1, 1 to Judges 3.6. So these are the main the main topics uh, that I want to cover tonight. So the first one is the key to judges. We need to understand what judges is about, why why the book of judges is there, the background to the judges and their rule, the opposing tribes and the influence over Israel, Israel's disobedience to God, the results of sin, the sinful cycle, and then we'll we'll wrap everything up and come to a conclusion. Now, you would say when looking at this, is, is all of this really only in three chapters? Uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, I didn't. there was so much stuff I could have put in here, but I thought I will just stay with the principle because, like I said when I started, I want to lay a foundation for what is coming. If you don't have the foundation of judges, you will not know why the judges are there, why these things, why Gideon was there, why Samson was there, why this one was there, um, and, and, and understand that. So... I really want you to pay attention tonight and really grasp what this is about. 
So let's start without uh, any further ado. Uh, yeah, let me just go back here. Let's, if you have your Bibles, I, I trust that I trust that you all have your Bibles with you because when we when when we when we speak, we do a lot of uh, Bible reading and we refer to scriptures. But I want to start with something. If you can, if you will turn uh, to the book of Judges, chapter 2, and I want to start reading from verse 7. And it says here, So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. So here we have Joshua, and we have the elders that were with him. The, the, uh, the Bible continues. Now, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him with the border uh, of, of his inheritance at Timnath, Heres, in the mountain of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Gash. Now, let's start. Let's start. So we understand Moses, his generation, and their generation that followed immediately after them all served the Lord. Now comes the key to the book of Judges. If you go to Judges, let's go once one verse, one, one verse down. It says here, when all the generations had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. So the generation that followed, that followed the Lord, that the Lord was with, that took them through the wilderness and brought them into the promised land, that generation passed away. Now, suddenly the new generation doesn't know what happened. Now, you know, I was thinking about this. Why, why do they not know? Is it the fact that their fathers hadn't taught them? Um, uh, did they not understand? Did they not have leaders? Uh, did they not have people around them that, that, that knew the history? Because someone must have known the history. But it says that the people didn't know. So that leads me to believe that there was nobody there that passed on that information, that passed on the, that, that knowledge to the next generation. Let's now look at, if we understand that now, Judges 2.10, let's look at John 14.21. And as, and, and, and as I said, this is the key to Judges. In John 14, 21, it reads that he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now, remember Judges 2.10. I want you to keep that in your mind all the time. Then look John 14, 21. Keep that in your mind as well. I want to read that again because I want to enforce a principle here tonight. It says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. So if we love God, we're going to keep his commandments. You know, we don't have the Ten Commandments anymore like they did in the Old Testament. It wasn't written on the tablets of stone. But the commandments are written in our hearts because God says, I have given you a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. He says, and I will write your laws on your heart. So our conscience and the Holy Spirit will always, always bring to remembrance and prompt us about the commandments of God. And if we love God, it says, and he who loves me will be loved by my father. So if we love the Lord Jesus Christ, God loves us. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. So if we love God, then God is going to manifest himself to us. And that's what pastor, you know, and, and I, I, you know, I listened to, uh, to a pastor speaking today and said he went through a tough time. But he was so close to God that he realized that he just hung on to what God did. And he sensed the presence of God. Why? Because he loved God. He loves God so much that he spent time with him in his time of tribulation and time of challenge. But he overcame that because God was with him and God took him through uh, and, and spiritually very strong. And I think that's how we need to be tonight. So this is, this is part of the foundation I really want to lay. Now, what is a judge? I, I, I need you to understand what is a judge. The definition of the judge is as follows. The Hebrew words sapat translate to judge in the book of Judges. The word implies every function of government, not just the judicial they were governors in the fullest sense. They were military leaders. They were executive. Uh, they were governors in the fullest sense. They were military leaders with executive and legislative power as well as judicial power. 
They were divinely appointed to deliver, God, to deliver God's people when the people turned from idols and returned back to God. Now, understand that they are just not somebody chosen, somebody that has some kind of a talent. These men and women were chosen by God. I will give you the scripture later on as we go on. See, in Israel denied her heritage, her identity, and her God. And that is the principal reason why the judges were there. So let's, let's, let's move on. This is the background to, to, uh, to judges and the rule. Like I said, I want to lay the foundation that we can be built upon. See, the judges governed Israel during the period of moral decay. Now, it's, at this period of time, it was also has been referred to by various scholars as the dark ages of the Hebrew history. And, you know, I will explain that as we go on and you'll actually see why they say that it is. It was this was between 1390 and 1050 B.C., See, the judges had regional influence over either a single tribe or several tribes. Judges ruled from Joshua's generation to approximately the fourth year of Solomon. So it's about 350 years that the judges, uh, that the judges were there. The ministry of the judges overlapped. So it's not a question of you have one judge, then another judge, then another judge. So there were various judges that had authority and rulership and control over various tribes at various times, and some of them overlapped each other because the judge was appointed for that particular time for that particular purpose. Judges, is, in a way, is another book of beginnings as we see a new nation adjusting to her national lifestyle. So let me explain that to you. Yeah, we have the tribe of Israel comes through the wilderness as God delivers them out of Egypt. Forty years they're in the wilderness. Joshua, uh, Moses dies, Joshua takes over, they cross the Jordan, they go into the promised land. Now, what we have is we have a, we have a, a, a nation of uh, tribes. We have a nation that is um, a tribalistic and moving a, around. Uh, they are nomads in a way. Suddenly, they come into a, a promised land that God has given them, and they need to change their lifestyle. Now they need to settle down. Now they need to start taking possession of the land. They need to cultivate. They need to work the land. They need to build cities. They need to start raising crops and, and families and things like that. But they also have um, an enemy that they need to overcome at the same time. So here they were in a new place, not quite sure what to do. Their former leader, Joshua, the strong one, was not there anymore. So now they're not quite sure what to do. So, so there's a bit of confusion that, that starts to manifest itself. And for, the, and for this time, it's, it's, it's like uh, they, they don't really know what to do. Uh, they know that they must follow God, but they also don't know what to do. So that's why they call it, uh, it's a new lifestyle. It's a, it's a new way of life and a new, a new beginning. So the old from, from the wilderness to the new into the Israel, now they need to start again. Now, as I said, they need to, they need to find ways and means of living, ways and means of doing things that they haven't done before. Now, let's go on to the three types of judges. There was the warrior judge such as Gideon and Samson. We know about Gideon. We know about Samson. We know that they were mighty men of valor. We have the priestly judge, such as Eli. We know who Eli was. Uh, we have the prophet, the prophet, prophet judges, such as Deborah and Samuel. Uh, as I said, I don't want to go too much into this because uh, we, we will talk about them in the, in the, in the next presentation that, that my colleagues will have. The chief judges were Samuel, Samson, Gideon, and Deborah. They were the chief judges at the time uh, of the judges. There was a total of 14 judges in all, and I've written them down here for you. So let's look who they are. We have Othaniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon, Tola, Jeh, Jephthah, Ibzan, Abdon, Samson, Elohim, Eli, and Samuel. Now, Eli and Samuel are not covered in the book of Judges, but they're covered in the first book of Samuel. Although they're in Samuel, they're still judges. So those were the so here we have we have the principle why the judges are there. We have the principle as to what they what they have been uh, chosen for, what they've been assigned for. We have the three types of judges that are there. We have the chief judges that were there. We have the fourteen judges that were there. And like I said to you, you know these people weren't just selected by uh, by the people. Judges two sixteen says nevertheless. 
The Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. So the judges were raised up by God for a purpose, to bring order, to bring structure, and to deliver them out of the hands of the people that were plundering the nation of Israel. And as we go on, you'll see that. Excuse me, I just need to have a quick drink here. Now, I trust that I've laid the foundation. That's the keys. That's that, 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 that's just quickly go back there. Judges 2.10, aligned with John 14.21. So the judges, the judges here, just to make sure that you understand, this is why the judges were there. But John 14.21 takes it now from the book of Judges in the Old Testament, and it takes it into the New Testament. So you can't say, oh, well, Judges was only for the Old Testament. No. There is a transition from the old into the new. It's not done away with. It's just carried forward, but just in a different dimension. Okay, let's have a look at the opposing tribes and the influence over Israel. So Joshua dies in the first in the, in, in in Judges chapter one. The people consult God for strategy how to possess the land given to them as an inheritance. Now Judah that's the kingly tribe, is appointed by God to lead the way in possessing the land. So they, God chooses them to go in. Why? Because they are the kingly, the, the kingly tribe. Now, I was wondering why the kingly tribe. Well, we are, they are kings. They are rulers. They are, they are priests, the same as we are. We are kings and rulers and priests with God because we are seated with him in heavenly places through the grace and through the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, Jesus is... Yeah, yeah, uh, Jesus, uh, God has saved the people. He's taken them into the promised land. He said that he, they are going to be kings and rulers of, of, uh, of the promised land. They're going to possess. They're going to rule. They're going to govern. So they are a kingly people. The only problem is, is God sees them as kingly, and they don't see themselves as kingly. As we go on, you'll see why. So Judah, the kingly tribe, appointed by God to lead the way in possessing the land. You see, consult God. God gives them strategy. They go in. See the opposition to Israel were the Canaan the opposition to Israel were the Canaanites who occupy the hill territory and the lowlands of the promised land, and the Philistines who will see who we will see play a major role in the history of Israel going forward. God's instruction was to drive them out and destroy them completely. He said they're there in the beginning. God went before before Israel and he drove the nations out, but he didn't drive them all out. He said to the, to the tribe of Israel, you go into the promised land. You must go and take and possess, possess the land, fight, kill the people, destroy them, burn their cities down. And he gave them certain other instructions. Israel had, to, had, had some success in the hilly areas, but failed to conquer the lowlands due to the strength of the Canaanites. Now, remember, the Canaanites were an established people living in the land. They knew how to work with iron. They had cities. They had infrastructure. They, they controlled the, the trade routes. So they were in control of the whole nation. And Israel had to come in and take possession of everything and get rid of their dominance and their control. Uh, in Judges 1.19, it says, So the Lord was with Judah, and they drove out the, mountain, the, drove out the mountaineers, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland because they had chariots of iron. Now remember, Israel came. When Israel went out of the promised land, the Egyptians chased them with their horses and chariots. What had happened to them? God, God, God uh, uh, drowned them all in, when they went through the Jordan. Here now, God is not there in terms of uh, delivering them, but God is there in terms of saving them and taking them through. But they had to deal with the, with, with the chariots. And they didn't have the, the ability or the technology at that time to deal with them. That's why they couldn't overcome uh, um, and, and, uh, and destroy them. And it goes on. Israel did not obey the word of the Lord. We see that in the word of God over and over again. We see that in our lifetime today over and over again, that the people don't obey the Lord. Now, if we turn, if you turn with me to um, Judges chapter one, starting somewhere from about verse 16, we start to see a pattern. Uh, we'll, okay, let, don't go there now. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll start to see a pattern. And basically the pattern is like this. 
Um, if we look at verse 16, it says, um, Aaron, and they went and dwelt among the people. See, God told them not to dwell among the people, but they went and dwelt amongst the people. In verse 19, it says, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland because they had chariots of iron that I've covered already. Verse 21, but the children of Benjamin did not drive out the, De the Jebusites. Then we move on to verse 27. It says, however, Manasseh did not. I actually want you to, un when, when we finish tonight, go get your Bible, go to chapter 1, and underline these portions of Scripture. There it says, 127, however, Manasseh did not. 129, nor did Ephraim. 1 verse 30, nor did Zebulun. 131, nor did Asher. 130, nor did Naphtal. And so it goes on, and it just says that these tribes didn't do what God commanded them to do. And there wasn't one. It was the majority of them. They didn't do. They didn't obey. They didn't listen. The consequences of their disobedience we'll look at, and it's actually quite scary. If you, As we go through tonight, I think you're going to really see how the tribe of Israel failed miserably. And I'm surprised that they were not destroyed, totally destroyed by, by, by the tribes. Yeah, I've said, yeah. The tribes influencing Israel were the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the, per the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Uh, I mean, crazy. These people were there. They were supposed to destroy them. Yet those that who were supposed to be destroyed became the destroyers of the, of the nation of Israel. And if, as I said, if it wasn't for God's grace and God's love and God's intervention, um, well, Israel wouldn't have existed anymore. But you see, the problem with that is, God says he made a covenant with them. So God cannot break his covenant. And that's why he had to intervene. But he did it in such a way that we need to take cognizance of that. And we, do, we need to understand that very clearly as we move on why and what God has done. And it's actually, uh, uh, it's actually a lesson for us. Let's have a look at Israel's disobedience to God. I've been talking about that now for a while. On your own, I want you to go and read Joshua chapter 23 and 24 and see what Joshua and God, what Joshua says and what God says to Joshua and to the tribe of Israel as to what they are supposed to do. We don't have the time to do that. I, I'm asking you uh, to please do that on your own, because if you do that, you will then understand the, the further consequences of what we're going, going tonight. So I thank you for your faithfulness in doing that. God gives them a warning. He says, have nothing to do with the inhabitants of the promised land. In other words, keep yourself separate. Do not, do not mix with the world. Do not contaminate yourself and don't let the world influence you. Isn't that the same today? We're in the world, but we're not part of the world. And we need to keep ourselves clean and we need to keep ourselves pure and we need to keep ourselves close to God so that the world doesn't influence us because it's easy to become contaminated by the world. The lusts of the flesh drive us, and you'll see that now. The lust of the flesh drives us. You see, many people say, oh, well, I'm not this and I'm not that anymore, and it's this and it's the lust of the eyes and so on and so on and so on. And these are the things that, that slowly but surely pull us away from the, from, from the presence of God, from the love of God, and the consequences today is no more different to what happened in, his, uh, in Israel at the time of Judges. He says, destroy them. See, we must fight. Israel had to destroy them, kill them, get them out. Okay, we don't kill them physically like they had to do, but we have to fight with them spiritually because God has given us weapons of warfare that are not carnal, but powerful in the spirit for, for uh, tearing down strongholds, uh, taking authority. God has given us weapons of warfare. Um, God had given, they had weapons of warfare to fight, but they fought, fought it just in a different way. Uh, drive them out. In other words, get them away. We need to drive out also anything that hinders us and, and separates us from the love of God. Don't serve other gods. Uh, uh, it, you'll see that, that, uh, that, um, Baal worship and Ashtoreth worship and all these other uh, man-made images throughout, not only in the book of Judges, but going throughout the book, the, the Old Testament, uh, that these things were always there to entice and to, uh, uh, and to bring the people of Israel away from God. You know, a man-made image can't talk. It's deaf and dumb. What can it do? I mean, I think of Dagon. We know when, Dagon, when, when the Ark of the Covenant went into the temple and, uh, uh, of Dagon, 
When they went there the next morning, Dagon was lying on his face. I mean, even an idol will bow when the presence of God is around. So we need to understand, we need to understand the power of the presence of God, that these things cannot, uh, cannot um, overcome the power of God. But if we allow it to do that, they will overcome us and they will take influence. I'll just give you an example. This Sunday, uh, the nation has called for uh, a day of prayer. For ancestral worship, they're going to call it the day of ancestral worship. So all the Sangomas and everyone else is going to call upon uh, a call upon uh, demons and principalities and powers to come and direct them. I mean, it's absolutely crazy, but this is what happened at the, that time. So it's no more different. You know, we as the body need to rise up and stand up against this thing. And you know, and so what? You know what? No demon, no power, no principality is going to influence us because strategically we have been placed here. And strategically as men and women of God, we have the authority over these things. And the principalities and powers need to bow to the authority and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Regrettably here, same thing happens, but they lose the fight. And you'll see as we go along. I don't want to go ahead of myself, but they lose the fight. What happens here? What is the outcome? It so said they said, don't intermarry. They intermarried. They gave each other's wives, uh, sons and daughters, and they mingled and they married and they created uh, um, a generation that was not supposed to be there. They had to keep themselves pure. They were immoral. They had to serve God only. They did not. And let's go on. What was the outcome? Remember, they went in the promised land. God gave them the promised land. They were supposed to go in plunder, possess, rule, and reign. Now, suddenly, they are made slaves. Um, the, the Israelites make the, um, the tribes slaves and use them as servants because they thought, oh, well, it's good. You know, I'm the master. I've got servants. So now suddenly I'm going to look grand in the eyes of, of, of the other people. So let's not kill them. Let's, let's use them as servants and, and, and make them subservient. Suddenly Israel begins to worship the idols of the nation. God warned them not to do that. They became morally corrupt. Their morals were tainted because, um, as you know, um, there was uh, idolatry worship, sexual worship, all these kind of things uh, that, that took place. And these things were lust of the flesh lust of the eyes, and they said, well, this looks good. Let's partake of this because it's, it's something we haven't had uh, because in Israel, uh, in, in, the, in the wilderness, these things were not there. Uh, they weren't there to tempt them. Now suddenly temptation comes, and they fall to temptation. They went and lived amongst them. They intermarried, which is one of the things I've covered already. He said, God, they shouldn't. And they forsook the commandments of the Lord. If there is one thing that, that is the principle or is that is the key, is, is that they forsook the commandments of the Lord. They disobeyed. They didn't listen. Let's have a look at Judges 2 and uh, verses 1 to 3. Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gigal to Bochum and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. I've alluded to that already. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land. They did. You shall tear down their altars. They did not. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Why have you done this? Therefore, I also, I also said I will not drive them out before you. But they shall be thorns in your side. And their gods shall be a snare to you. This is the angel of the Lord. He arrives and he says, boy, I've got a judgment against you. You guys have disobeyed me. This is what I've done. This is my promise. Uh, you didn't obey. Look what's going to happen. He says, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? How many times do we hear that today when we speak to people? We say, why have you done this? When our children are disobedient, we say to them, why have you done this? We are asking them. But you know the right way. Why are you doing something wrong? Therefore, I also said I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. Crazy, 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 crazy. That the people that Israel was supposed to defeat 
became a snare and a thorn, a thorn in their side, constantly, every time they move, they feel that pain. Every time they turn, they feel that pain. These people are constantly in their faces, constantly on their side, harassing them, uh, um, influencing them, strategizing them, controlling them, manipulating them. So the, the role has been reversed. From kings, they have become slaves. Crazy, crazy, crazy. And I never even thought that these things were part of the book of Judges. I had Samson, Delilah, Gideon. Those were the things that, for me, uh, stood out about Judges. Suddenly, there's a different story here and a different, and a different complexion. Totally, totally. Let's go on. Disobedience versus obedience. The results of sin. Let's have a look at Judges 2, chapter 11. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among, among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Asterisk. I beg your pardon. How many times has God said, "Don't do that"? When Moses went up into the mountain, or the, to be with the mountain, to be up into the mountain to be with with God, and he was uh, spending time with God, what happened to the people? They said to the priests, "Moses is not coming back. Let's build a calf. Let's build this golden calf." So who did they worship? God in the mountain that they could see over there, or this idol that they that they produced with the gold. Exactly the same thing. Yeah, they do it again. They just bow to the handmade gods. Uh, uh, you know, and it talks about gods. It doesn't talk about a god. It's God. So there was more than one type of god. Uh, but in Baal worship and Astaroth worship, there were hundreds of them. And they, 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 they bowed to them. They worshipped them. Uh, they did the stuff that they wasn't, weren't supposed to do. Absolutely crazy. I mean, uh, maybe I shouldn't say crazy because we also sometimes... Don't obey what we what God says, and we do our own thing, uh, and and we we step off the tracks. But I just thank God that um, even in the time of the judges, that God that God intervenes, and even un, in our lives, the Holy Spirit is there to just say, "Hey, Buti, or to be so just get back on track, because otherwise you're going to get hurt, and the consequences for you are not going to be pleasant. The consequences for these people were horrendous." If we look at verse 14, they were delivered into the hands of the plunderers. So they were supposed to be the plunderers and, and the ones that took, but they were plundered. They were overcome and they were weak. Verse 15, it says, the hand of the Lord was against them. The hand of the Lord was against Israel. Israel was in distress. They were crying. They was gnashing of teeth. They was wailing. They were just saying, what is going on? Verse 17. They would not listen to the judges. Remember, they, judges were appointed by God to take the people out and to, and to save them. But they wouldn't listen. They just wouldn't listen. Um, if you have a look, if you have a look um, at chapter 2, verse 18, it says, And then the Lord raised up judges for them. The Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of the enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groanings because those who oppressed them and harassed them. So God sent the judge to deliver them because they were oppressed and they were harassed. And it goes on and it says in verse 19, And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn ways. Isn't it amazing? When a strong leader is taken out, the people go crazy. They do their own thing. They just do their own thing. Isn't that the same today? Everyone is doing their own thing. Whatever is pleasant, whatever they feel is, is the right thing, uh, they do. Why? Because they regard unto themselves. Uh, we don't need to submit to, a, to a, a God that we don't know. 
Uh, we, can, we, we are gods. We are kings. We can do what we want. That's what the world advocates. But that's not what God advocates. God says that we must love him. We must serve him. Uh, complete different paradigm here. Let's go to verse 18. They were oppressed. They were harassed. Groanings to God. Now, I read some of that. Verse 19. They become more corrupt, more stubborn, did their own thing. Your own brackets are put here. Familiar to present times. Same thing is happening today. Same thing is happening today. I said at the beginning that there's nothing new under the sun. So we're just repeating the cycle, but we're just doing it in a different time. But yet the principle is identical. It's absolutely the same. Verse 20, they transgressed. Uh, disobedient, lawless. Non they didn't conform. Uh, they just transgressed against God. Look at uh, Judges chapter 3, verse 4. And they were left. That is the people that, that uh, the, 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 um, the, tri the, the people that the tribes were supposed to destroy, they were not totally destroyed. Not, neither did God destroy them. He says, and they were left that he might test Israel by them to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Interesting. Very, very interesting. God allowed these tribes uh, uh, or these, these nations that they were supposed to have been destroyed to remain so that God would, would, would check to see whether they would follow God or not. So these were the thorn in the flesh, constantly there, day and night, harassing, harassing, harassing. What did the people do? God says, I might test Israel by them. See, God uses situations and circumstances for the good. Why were they there? God wanted to use them to turn Israel back to him. We'll see whether they did it or whether they didn't. We're coming to a close. I need to watch the time. I might just run out of time here, but yeah. I wasn't sure where to put this to put the slide actually, whether to put it in the beginning or whether to put it in the end. But I actually felt that it would be better if we put it towards the end, because after laying the foundation uh, of what we've done already this evening, I want to start closing by by using this. Uh, don't look at the don't look at the well, you're looking at it anyway. But let's have a look at the sinful cycle. In Judges 17, 6, it says in those days. There was no king in Israel. Everyone did was what, what was right in his own eyes. So everyone was a boss. Everyone did what they wanted to do. If they thought it was good, they did it. In Judges 2.13, they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Astros. So here we go, idol worship. Now the Judges is full, the book of Judges is full of rebellion. It's full of punishment. It's full of misery. It's full of deliverance, it's full of compromise, and it's full of confusion. I want to read that again so that you understand what the book of Judges is about. It's full of rebellion. It's full of punishment. If the people rebel, they get punished. It's full of misery. Why? Because instead of being joy, peaceful, happy, everything, they were misery. They were misery. They were miserable. Why? Because the thorn in their flesh was harassing them. It was destroying them. It was eating up the promises that they had. Then comes deliverance. But then after deliverance comes compromise. And then comes confusion. How many people do you know today that don't serve God and that are in a state of confusion? They don't know they're left from the right. They don't know who's God and who's not God. They don't know what's right and what's not right. But what does 17 6 says? Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. If we follow God and God leads us and guides us like they did in the book of Judges chapter 1, when they consulted with God and said, right, who does what? And God said, okay, let the tribe, let the tribe of Judah go first. The kingly tribe, the priestly tribe, let it go first. God gave direction. What happened? If you read the first couple of uh, the first few verses of chapter one, you'll see that there was victory. They overcame. They destroyed. They, they they destroyed the inhabitants. They took cities. They did everything. Now suddenly it goes from that kind of overcoming, winning, um, controlling situation to chaos, absolute chaos. People who spend their life in disobedience make little progress during their lifetime. You see people today not moving anywhere. They're confused. Most of the time they're disobedient. 
And because of their disobedience, they don't move. They stagnate. They stay. They re- in fact, they actually don't go forward. They regress. They become worse and worse. What is the summary of the book of Judges? We have seven apostasies, seven servitudes to seven idolatrous and cruel nations and seven deliverances. Amazing. As I said to you, we know about Gideon. We know about Samson. We know about this one. We know about Deborah. But we don't see. We don't understand this. We don't see this. Uh, I didn't see this. I must say I learned a lot. Let's have a look at the drawing that I've got on the right hand side. And let's start at the top where it says sin. So sin, what does sin do? Sin takes us in a spiral. Sin be- makes us become slaves. We we talk about servitude. We become we become servants or slaves to that sin which controls us. Israel sinned, they become slaves. They become slaves to the people that they were supposed to control and dominate and destroy. Then what happens is there comes supplication. They get they become miserable, they cry, they cry out to the Lord, and the Lord saves them. There comes a repentance, a supplication before God. Uh, God saves them. What happens then? Then there's a movement from supplication to salvation where God delivers them and sets them free. Now suddenly they're free because someone has intervened. The judge has taken them by control and he sorted them out. He set them, he set them free from, uh, from the oppression and the servitude and everything goes well. The judge dies. We go back to 219 or yeah, 219. And the people become become crazy again. They lose the plot. They go absolutely bonkers. And the next minute, they're back in sin. A vicious cycle. Maybe this cycle is relevant in, in your life or my life. Or you know somebody who's, whose life is like this. They go from sin to servitude to supplication to salvation. And then everything goes well and good. And then the next minute, they forget about God. And when they open their eyes again, then they're back in sin. See, this cycle of defeat and decline needs to be broken. Because once you get to supplication and salvation, there must come servitude. We must put in there servitude, obedience to God, faithfulness, walking with God. Because then the silence will disappear and the sin will get rid of. If we don't deal with the sin, we are going to go in this spiral uh, of of defeat and decline. And God intervenes and then we lose the plot again. Absolutely crazy. Uh, and as I said, I'm not going to cover the seven apostasies and the seven uh, servitudes um, and the seven deliverances because the, uh, uh, um, the other guys will cover that in the next in the next two sessions. And so I don't want to go there other than to say you need to be aware of these and you need to take cognizance of this because whilst this is there in the book of Judges, it is there in the present day. It's absolutely there in the present day. So coming to a conclusion, what is the answer? See, it's the wickedness of the human heart. That's it. It's lawlessness. It's the heart. It's the heart because everything stems from the heart. I beg your pardon. Everything stems from the heart. See, God is able to use weak things and bring victory to them. Now, God used the weak things. Now, if you look at Gideon and if you look at Samson and you look at all of these things, you will see where the weakness comes in, that God uses weakness and it becomes a strength and it brings deliverance. God uses situations for his good and to see how we react to them. You see, you can something can happen. A situation can arise. You can be controlled by that situation. And depending on how you deal with it will dictate how you overcome it. So you will either attack it head on spiritually, face it with authority, the power of God, spiritual warfare. You're strong. You face it with that. You face it with the wisdom of God and you overcome it. If you if you don't do that, it's going to run you crazy. It's going to cause chaos in your life. That will follow you for many, many years and, in fact, even generations. People, current generations are being influenced and, and, and compromised and everything because of the sin of the forefathers. That generational curse will follow you. You must check to see 
alcoholism, smoking, these kind of things. That's a generational curse. Who did it? Now, my dad smoked and my uncle smoked. And my, it's a sin. It's a curse. Deal with it. Break that cycle. We need to break that cycle. Find out what's going on. Deal with it in your family. Allow God to set you free. Be free from these things. Righteousness calls for separation from the world. Remain holy. Remain obedient. Keep the commandment. Wage war against sin and unrighteousness. See, we're not fighting with flesh and blood. We are fighting principalities and powers. We are fighting with the Holy Spirit that indwells us. They were fighting it uh, naturally, but they also had God to lead them. The angel of the Lord was there. God was with them. Wherever they went, God went before them. Now, when they don't do that, they go on their own, and they get a, they get a hiding. So many times they, get, they got thrashed. Why? Because God wasn't there. God allowed them to get to lose the war. It's the same with us. If we don't let God go a, a, ahead of us, if we don't, you know, if we don't let the Spirit of God lead us and guide us, because remember, it's a leading. It's not a we lead Him; He leads us, and that's what we need to be careful of. See, God does not forsake His covenant. We need to understand that, people. God doesn't forsake His covenant. The, co the Abrahamic covenant is is relative for us today because it's just been enforced by the blood of Jesus Christ and his, and his death and resurrection on the cross. But he allows our very weakness, our guilty weakness, to drive us back to him. If we fall, our guilt and our shame and our weakness will get us to a place. We, like the prodigal son, we, we will return to the Father, and the Father will be watching for us from afar, and he will restore us to a place of righteousness and a place of authority and, and, and again, we will eat of the fullness of the, uh, that, that fatted calf. We will eat that. That's God's promise. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. Remember, I want to close with this. Remember, Israel is a chosen nation. Why would God choose them and then destroy them? Remember what Moses said to God? You know, when God, when, 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 the, when the people in Israel uh, or the Israelites rebelled in the desert, God says, well, I'm going to destroy them. Moses got, got in front of God and said, hey, come now, wait a minute. If you destroy them, the world is going to turn around and say, what kind of a God are you that, you that you take somebody out and that you destroy them? That's not the way to do it. And God, and God re relented from what he was going to do. He dealt with their sin, but he didn't destroy them. And in the same principle of Judges, um, many times they, the, the Israelites got to a place where they were virtually annihilated. But because of the covenant, God intervened. He raised up men and women at an appropriate time and an appropriate place to bring deliverance and bring restoration and turn the nation of Israel and us back to God. See, we need to understand that. Well, that's, that's, that's where I would like to end off tonight. And... Um, uh, I just want to say this was a revelation for me. I must be very honest because only in the first two and a bit chapters, all of this takes place. The whole nation upside down, changed, rebellion, uh, all those kind of things. But yet constantly God is always there saying, come on, I'm here. I want to restore you. I want I want to redeem you. Um, I, I want to take care of you. I want to make you that nation uh, that 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 I have called you and chosen you for. You know, it's like with us, God. God is always with us. If we would just open our eyes and our spirits to see that God will never leave us or forsake us. So I end with that. If there's uh, Vata, if there's any questions or anyone has something to say, uh, thank you, Uncle Olvain. Very insightful, very detailed. We thank you for that. Uh, we learned a lot, I'm sure everyone. So um, I just want to ask, is there anyone you want to ask a question, uh, raise something? Please, if you can raise your hand or unmute yourself and just ask. Uh, please, we are looking forward to your questions this evening. Um, is there anyone for us? We've got a question. Um, Pastor yes, Pastor Hannes. Hannes, I see your hand is raised. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, I did ask a question um, during your presentation. And, uh, and, and you covered that, but I'm going to ask you again because it's so significant and, and real and it's up almost how can it happen? So the question is how, why and how did Israel always turn their backs on, on, on their true God? You know, how is it possible that people, you know, God delivers them 
He does, does miracles in their, in, in their lives. And then, you know, the next generation or even in that generation, they just turn their backs. Um, you know, they just turn their backs on, on, on God and just uh, um, walk away from him. Um, so you've, you've uh, maybe I should ask you, but you have answered that. Um, but I just want to throw it back to you again, Alvin. Well, I think the, I think the, the the easiest way to answer that is to go back to the sinful cycles. Is in those days there yeah. was no king in Israel, so there was no authority, there was no leadership, there was no. Uh, if we talk about it today, where 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 is that kingly priesthood that is that is leading us and guiding us and speaking into our lives and bringing uh, uh, and, and saying, "Thus saith the Lord." Where where are those people that are taking us back to God? You see, because everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Yes, I'm saying I'm not saying the people are not there. They are there. But nobody wants to listen to them anymore because then the reason for that is simple. They don't want to bow their knee and submit to God. They want to do their own thing. And that's the problem. The, 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 the men and women of God are there saying, thus saith the Lord, here is this, here is that. But the people are misguided and misled. And the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the attraction of the world is more insightful because they can say, well, I don't have to tithe. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to go to home cell. I don't have to obey. If I don't want to, I don't have to. So I'm not going to because I'm a, I'm a king and a priest. Every, you know, the new world order says that you are a God unto yourself. And yeah. that's a problem that we are replacing God with our own gods. Us, we are serving ourselves. We're serving mammon and we're serving flesh. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. I agree with you. It's only... The cycle, as you were saying, um, the cycle can only be broken. The, the sinful nature, that cycle can only be broken uh, through the blood of Jesus Christ and a willing heart to submit to Jesus. You know, that's, you see, that's the faith. only way. You see, yeah. it's, it's, by, it's by faith that we serve God. It's yeah. by faith that we are saved. Uh, so it's, it's a belief. It's a belief in, 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 in the Godhead. It's a belief in Jesus Christ. Because only through Christ can we be saved and reconciled to God. And people people don't don't want that. They don't they don't want to do that. They just don't. They have the opportunity. I mean, everyone when they stand before before the the, the great uh, throne judgment of God, they will see where God gave them an opportunity to turn to Him, and they will see where they denied Him. Yeah. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you Pleasure for that uh, response. Uh, Christo, um, let's just see before Christo, is there anyone else that wants to ask a question? Uh, let me see if there's anyone. Okay, Christo, uh, you can ask your question. Thank you. About it, yeah, look, I just want to, to make a contribution and I'll be quick because I see we're running out of time. But it's, it's, it's relates to this thing about sin and turning your back back on God. And uh, look, there's, there's, there's a fight between uh, the flesh and the spirit. Uh, the spirit wants to serve God because you are, if you are a born again, you're a new creature and you want to do the right things. But the flesh is the one that wants to, to, to please itself. And there's this ongoing fight between spirit and flesh. And I just want to uh, uh, leave it there by saying, uh, if, if we feed our flesh the most, food, the flesh is going to be stronger and you're going to uh, be a slave to the flesh. But if we serve our, uh, if we feed our spirit uh, more food than we feed our flesh, our spirit will be able to overrule the flesh. Um, and and there's, a, there's, a, there's a very quick anecdote that I want to tell you. There was a guy who was involved in dog fights. He had a black dog and he had a white dog. And then when they used to get the dogs to fight together, he would bet. And whenever he bets on whatever dog, that dog was winning. And this went on and he made a lot of money. And then eventually somebody asked him, but listen, what is your secret? He says, no, it's very easy. If I want the white dog to win, for that week I lock the black dog up and I don't give him food. And then it's a no-brainer, the white dog will win. And vice versa, then he changes around. If he wants the black dog to win, he locks up the white dog and he doesn't give him food. Now the white and the black, the one is the spirit, one is the flesh. If we, if we lock up the, the flesh and we don't feed the flesh, you will never be able to overrule our spirit. And I just want to 
to leave it there. There is a responsibility on our side to feed our spirits and make sure our, our spirit is in tip-top shape so that the flesh can submit. Thank you. No, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly with what you said, Christo. Yeah, thank you, Christo, for that contribution. Um, I think if there's no other questions this evening, it's uh, one minute past nine. Uncle Olvain, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate the teaching and we're looking forward to next week's topic. It's gonna, uh, it's definitely going to raise more points and um, some more deeper dwelling into judges. So thank you, Uncle Olvain. Thank you for everyone that was online this evening. And uh, thank you for being online.